Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this special celebratory event. My name is David Palmer, and it is my privilege to serve as University of Toronto's Vice President Advancement, and I'll be serving as your Master of Ceremonies today. Our first order of business, to thank those extraordinary young musicians who shared their talents with us as you arrived. Uh, I'd like to introduce them first before our applause. Uh, Adrian, Adrian Irvine, uh, violin and lead musician. Filippo uh, Lazuriaga, uh, did I get that right, Felipe? At violin, Natalie Dick, vi viola, and Sally He in cello. Thank you so much. We're here this morning to extend our deep gratitude to the BMO Financial Group and to celebrate their steadfast and loyal support of the excellence at the University of Toronto. In 2018, we were honored to include BMO in our Chancellor Circle of Benefactors, a recognition society that celebrates donors whose generosity has had a truly transformational impact on this university, supporting U of T faculty and students in achieving some of their greatest aspirations. As many of you know, the BMO Financial Group has a long history of generosity, investment, and involvement with the University of Toronto. Over the years, its strategic support has targeted initiatives of immense impact on our students, on research and teaching, on the creation of state-of-the-art facilities, and on the university's capacity for global leadership and impact on issues that profoundly impact our societies at large. In 1996, BMO contributed three million, matched by the university and by the province of Ontario, to create the BMO National Scholars Program. Today, this is one of the country's most prestigious award programs, attracting superbly talented students from across the country. In 2010, BMO's donation to the Boundless Campaign of 2.5 million supported the expansion and renovation of the Rotman School of Management, the creation of the BMO Financial Group Finance Research and Trading Lab, empowering teaching and research with advanced computer hardware and sophisticated financial analysis software. And part of that donation also helped improve access to higher education for deserving students from some of our most disadvantaged communities through the creation of the BMO Financial Group Access to Higher Education Award at Woodsworth College. In 2017, BMO Financial Group announced a $21 million gift to seven academic hospitals affiliated with U of T's Faculty of Medicine in support of advancing science research and the enhancement of patient care. And in the same year, BMO honored outgoing CEO William Down by establishing the BMO Chair in Finance at the Rotman School, and as many of you know, Bill is a graduate of the university's MBA program and a dedicated volunteer. Well, this type of forward-thinking, strategic philanthropic support is a hallmark of BMO's generosity. It is vitally important for our researchers to continue advancing knowledge at the leading edge of a wide range of fields, and it is also vital for our ability to offer dynamic undergraduate and graduate programs that attract some of the best students from across Canada and around the world. And it is vital for our researchers and students to explore new challenges and dramatic changes affecting our lives today. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Marek Gertler, President of the University of Toronto, to tell you about an exciting new initiative that BMO Financial Group has made possible. Professor Marek Gertler is one of the world's foremost urban theorists and policy practitioners. He is widely known as an expert on innovation, creativity, and culture as drivers of, economic, of the economic dynamism of city regions. He has served as an advisor to local, regional, and national governments in Canada, the United States, and Europe, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, the Academy of Social Sciences UK, a corresponding fellow of the British Academy. He also holds the Golden Chair in Canadian Studies at the University of Toronto. And in 2015, he was appointed to the Order of Canada. Please join me in welcoming President Gertler. Well, thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here on this very, very big day. Let me begin by extending very special warm greetings to Daryl White, Chief Executive Officer of BMO Financial Group, uh, who joins me in announcing today's tremendous news. Welcome also uh, to the Honorable Ross Romano, uh, Ontario's Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities, and Member of Provincial Parliament for Sault Ste. Marie, Minister Romano, it's wonderful to have you here and joining us again. 
Greetings also to Nat Aristich, BMO's Director of Corporate Donations, to Professor Melanie Wooden, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science, and the other prominent members of the U of T community are, who are here with us this morning. They include our Chancellor, of course, Dr. Rose Patton, who is well known to many of you as a longtime senior executive at BMO Financial Group, currently holding the position of Special Advisor to the CEO and Senior Executives. And warm greetings to Dr. Rob Pritchard, President Emeritus of the University of Toronto, who's currently Chairman of the Board of BMO Financial Group. Well, U of T is very proud of his deep and long-standing ties with BMO Financial Group, so I hope you'll allow me to drop two more names uh, of prominent U of T alumni who have served in BMO's highest ranks. Uh, Bill Down, who David mentioned just a minute ago, and another former CEO, Tony Comper. And let me add that these are just a few of the very large number of U of T graduates who have built their careers at BMO and who currently work for BMO. David has just shared with you some of the history of BMO's philanthropic leadership in support of U of T. And now I'm delighted to help announce the next exciting chapter in that wonderful relationship. As we all know, we live in a time of astonishingly rapid social and technological change. And nowhere is this more evident than in the realm of artificial intelligence and the advance of machine learning over the past decade. AI applications are now transforming the way we communicate, how we get from A to B, how we work and do business, even how we diagnose disease and discover new cures. And as the world has noticed, U of T is in the global vanguard of this revolution. In light of these developments, it is critically important that we realize the full promise of AI while ensuring that its impact on individuals and on our society will be positive. So it is my great pleasure to share with you today that BMO Financial Group is renewing its philanthropic investment in the University of Toronto with an unprecedented benefaction. This incredibly generous gift has enabled us to create a new initiative to be known as the BMO Lab for Creative Research in the Arts, Performance, Emerging Technologies, and AI. The BMO Lab will explore the human side of AI and reveal its tremendous potential to enable novel forms of human expression. It will combine U of T's globally recognized strengths in the arts and humanities with our trailblazing research in AI, machine learning, and other technologies. It will gather together artists, scientists, humanists, and thought leaders for high-profile events and discussions about the role of these technologies in our lives. And it will help train a new generation of transdisciplinary leaders, empowering them to meet the practical challenges that governments and businesses will face in the decades to come. This historic and transformative gift is further evidence of BMO's commitment to playing a leading role in Canadian society by helping us seize the opportunities of the 21st century in a way that will benefit all people. So on behalf of the University of Toronto, let me conclude by saying to Daryl White and to BMO Financial Group, thank you for your visionary leadership and generosity, for your long-standing partnership with U of T, and for making this wonderful new initiative possible. Thank you. Now let me introduce our next speaker. Throughout his outstanding career at BMO, and since his appointment as CEO nearly two years ago, Daryl White has shown himself to be an immensely talented executive and a dynamic community leader with a compelling vision for service and philanthropy. It's my great honor and pleasure to ask him to speak to us now to announce formally this landmark act of philanthropy. Please join me in welcoming Daryl to the podium. Well, thank you, Professor Gertler, and uh, thank you, David. 
That was a fantastic warm up, and I'm glad, of course, to know that Rose Patton is here with us. As we joked earlier, she has a foot in each of these canoes, and that's well, she has a hand in two other canoes and her other hand in another one, and it's wonderful to have you here with us. Um, indeed, it is our sincere pleasure and privilege to thank everybody at the University of Toronto for arranging today's event, and Minister Romano, thank you for joining us today as well. I'm pleased, of course, as you are, that Rob Pritchard was able to join us today because apart from being chairman of our board at BMO, I can assure you that Rob's heart is still very much in U of T. And if you don't believe me, you ought to see anybody who comes into our boardroom for the first time to make a presentation get asked where they went to school. And depending on the answer, they are told that's excellent or it's unfortunate. <laughs> Rob, of course, served as president of U of T from 1990 to 2000, and in fact, was appointed as president of U of T 30 years ago this week. I'm pretty sure that he too will love today's announcement. I'm also um, pleased to welcome other members of BMO's board of directors. Philip Orsino is here, as is Ron Farmer. Thank you for attending. It's a real treat, I must say, that this event has been arranged here in Hart House because despite its Gothic Hogwarts feel, it, of course, has a long history, a very long history, of always being on the cutting edge. And today's announcement will be no different. Some of the most successful Canadian performing artists have cut their, their teeth here in Hart House, from Raymond Massey to Norman Jewison to Do Donald Sutherland to Lorne Michaels, and even, even Meryl Dennison, who may be known to theater people as a playwright but to most of us at BMO, he's the author who 50 years ago penned a riveting 900-page history of our bank. <laughs> and his day job, as it turns out, was the artistic director here at Hart House. So Hart House is, of course, the perfect place for us to announce this exciting and innovative collaboration that we hope will not only revolutionize theater, but change more broadly the way people think about artificial intelligence and think about the meaning of AI in their lives. So it's with great pride that we announce today that we are establishing the BMO Lab for Creative Research in the Arts, Performance, Emerging, emerging Technologies, and AI, and supporting this lab with an unprecedented $5 million donation. Now, some of you may be thinking, that boy, that's a long name. And it is a long name, and it needs to be, though, to, to encompass all of the diverse applications that will converge in this space. And complementing our existing support for the Vector Institute, this is the largest donation of its kind ever made by BMO. And it also complements an earlier donation we made to the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo to establish the Isaac no Newton Chair in Theoretical Physics. People were surprised then that a bank would make such a donation to fund pure research in physics. And it will come as no surprise to me this time if people are once again surprised by our announcement. But it makes eminent sense, and let me explain why. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, this is our future. It is inevitable and undeniable, and it will change the way we do things, all things. And the project we're funding at U of T is the first of its kind in the world to explore in a deliberate and focused way how AI will reshape the arts and humanities. Our goal is to deepen our understanding and appreciation for these new technologies by examining the human side of their use. Positioned in the Drama Center, the BMO Lab brings together two of this university's great, great research strengths. On the one hand, AI, and on the other, the arts and humanities. It will bring together a new generation of students and help them think critically 
across disciplines. In fact, I was delighted to learn that half of the students already enrolled in this program come from a computer science and engineering background, and the other half are from arts and humanities. It's such an incredible meeting of the minds. And for us as business leaders, this multidisciplinary approach in the workforce of the future is critical. Our partnership to launch the BMO Lab represents a unique convergence of technology and the humanities, providing opportunities for students to research AI and shift the paradigm of creativity. Because to strengthen their competitiveness, companies must harness the full power and potential of technologies responsibly. While delivering talent for the future, including investing in employee training and upskilling. At BMO, we're seeing the tremendous benefits of the integration of AI. It's freeing up capacity for employees to engage in valuable, insight-driven work and creating benefits for customers, such as radically reducing the time to open business banking accounts or protecting our customers by identifying sophisticated fraud patterns early. Alumni from this BMO lab will be among the best prepared in the world for this new world of work to design user experiences, curate customer engagement with AI, and help lead companies like ours in navigating these important big picture questions. So to conclude, we're confident this journey will yield very important learnings. At the same time, we know it's an exciting journey because it has the element of the unknown. And like any research, there is no definitive timetable for the discovery. But we do know that by investing in the future here at U of T, we are investing in all of our futures. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. White, for your insightful words and your generous support of this initiative in making this possible. I would also like to add my thanks to Merrix for uh, the support from Nana Ristich, the legendary Nana Ristich. I have learned, as generations of Bank of Montreal CEOs have learned before me, the wisdom of listening to Nana Ristich. <laughs> I'm expecting that to be a bestseller at Indigo in the near future. Well, as you heard, the BMO Lab is a unique and inspiring initiative, and I'm looking forward to the invaluable public conversations it will lead and to the ingenuity, ingenuity it will bring to training a new generation of tech-savvy leaders, as Daryl said. Now, um, I have the pleasure of introducing a special guest uh, here to us today. Uh, so I'll begin by introducing a key partner of the University of, on, uh, and of, uh, of the universities and Ontario's post-secondary education system, the Honorable Ross Romano, Minister of Training Colleges and Universities and MPP for Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, first elected in a by-election in 2017, he was re-elected in the general election of 2018 and appointed to his current cabinet portfolio in June 2019. Uh, Minister, we are very pleased that you are here with us today. And just before I ask you to step up and say a few words, uh, I would like to um, introduce, pre-introduce, the speaker who will immediately follow the minister, and that is Professor Melody Wooden, our recently appointed dean at the Faculty of Arts and Science. Professor Wooden is a neuroscientist in the Department of Cell and Systems Biology, previously served as the faculty's vice dean of interdivisional partnerships. She will tell you more about the far-reaching impact uh, the BMO Lab will have. Uh, but first, Minister, if you would join us, we would be honoured. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that very warm welcome. Uh, much appreciated and uh, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to uh, share in this uh, momentous and uh, historic occasion 
uh, with, uh, with you today. This is uh, something that uh, I, I certainly want to offer very specific thanks to uh, Dr. Gertler uh, and the few conversations we've had to date. I, I feel very positive moving forward in uh, the type of relationship that we can develop and uh, try to work together in every possible way. And uh, certainly uh, to uh, Mr. White and, um, and your team at BMO, this is, this is incredible news. Uh, what is uh, the partnership that you already have here is uh, so evident and so strong. And what you're doing for the future of post-secondary education and bringing together uh, a nexus uh, between uh, the arts, the humanities, and, uh, and technology is, is so critical. We always want to look at ways to innovate, ways to be better, ways to give our students the best possible education. And uh, really at U of T, you continue to lead the pack uh, throughout our province and, and certainly throughout the country. And so I want to offer congratulations, of course, to uh, U of T. And um, uh, this, is, uh, this is very, very, very good news. And uh, a wonderful way of looking at innovation and sort of looking, and I know you heard me say this last time I spoke, but in the words of Wayne Gretzky, where the puck is going. And uh, this, is, uh, this is very positive news. Uh, when we look at what we want to do to ensure our students' success, uh, we know uh, technology plays such a critical role. We know um, where things are going and to be able to blend and uh, to be able to use and leverage these private uh, partnerships is so critical to ensuring that uh, the students are going to continue to get the absolute best in education. And so I just want to say from the bottom of my heart that was a wonderful welcome. If you came, if you sort of grew up in the background I did, I would never have envisioned an opportunity to sit before uh, you all at the University of Toronto, which um, from my perspective as the minister, I want to see our entire post-secondary education system in Ontario be recognized as world leaders. But without you, the flagship of our education system in Ontario and certainly the best uh, in the country uh, I want to do everything I can uh, to help you continue to just continue to move up that, uh, that ladder on the world stage. You are global leaders. We thank you very much for that. Uh, on behalf of, uh, of uh, the Government of Ontario, we thank you for that. We thank you, BMO and uh, U of T, for continuing to pave the road uh, uh, for our students and our futures moving forward. Thank you very much. So thank you, Minister Romano, for joining us today and for those enlightening remarks. As Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science, I'm thrilled to share the excitement and deep gratitude we have uh, to the BMO Financial Group for this incredible initiative at the nexus of the humanities and technology, and for your extraordinary vision and support. The BMO Lab for Creative Research in the Arts, Performance, Emerging Technologies and AI will be an outstanding opportunity for our faculty and students to forge new pathways in problem solving and develop novel spheres of thought. In this multidisciplinary experiential learning lab, our scholars and students will use AI as a tool like never before to, forge, uh, to evoke human expression in the creative arts and humanities and to advance a better understanding of the world as we know it. The Center for Drama, Theatre and Performance Studies is already collaborating with the BMO Lab. Together with computer science and comparative literature, along with our partner in visual studies at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Lands Architecture, Landscape and Design. And I'm really keen to see what will unfold when collaborations expand as they launch with Cinema Studies, Cognitive Science, the Center for Ethics, the Field Institute for Research uh, in Mathematical Sciences, the Jackman Humanities Institute, not to mention various departments in the Faculty of Applied Sciences and Engineering. This is ideation at its very best. The potential for growing research and learning cl clusters in the BMO lab is limitless. Not only will this transformative lab reimagine teaching and learning 
and attract stellar uh, scholars from around the globe, but it will grow a prominent and global alumni network, which will be even more prepared for the future of work with deep knowledge, communication skills, and fluency in AI and teamwork. <clears throat> I'm thrilled to be hosting the BMO Lab in the Faculty of Arts and Science at U of T and really can't wait for what lies ahead. So thank you once again to our benefactor, BMO Financial Group, Daryl White, and Nara Rastich. And now we're gonna hear more about this important initiative with a conversation on arts and technology. I'm pleased to introduce our inaugural director of the BMO Lab for Creative Research in the Arts, Performance, Emerging Technologies, and AI, who will leave what I'm sure is going to be a scintillating conversation with Vector Institute Research Director Richard Zemmel. So Toronto-based David Rockaby is an award-winning installation artist who's been creating and exhibiting his fine works across Canada and across the globe since 1982. He first focused on interactive pieces that directly engaged the human body or involved artif uh, artificial perception systems. But most recently, his career has expanded to include video, kinetic, and static sculpture. Richard Zemmel is a professor of computer science at the University of Toronto, where he's been on faculty since 2000. He did his undergraduate degree in history and science at Harvard, a PhD here at U of T, and postdoctoral fellowships at the Salk Institute and Carnegie Mellon University. He's co-founder of a startup called Smart Finance, and his research involves machine learning, foundational systems based on representational data, and more. So please join me in welcoming David Rockaby and Richard Zemmel. from up here. I wanted to make sure our microphones are going. Yeah, great. <clears throat> so it is a really exciting uh, thing to be here finally after a lot of planning, a lot of uh, brainstorming, a lot of hard work. Um, it's, it seemed almost impossible that we would get to this point uh, when we started on this journey. And I wanted to really thank my partners in crime here, Pia Kleber and uh, Tamara Trojanowska for um, for keeping, we, we were a hardcore team developing the ideas and the strategies for making this happen. So we sit here at the University of Toronto at an epicenter of machine learning research in the world. Uh, really a fundamental and terribly important place. I think it, we kept AI alive in the 90s, didn't we? Yeah. So basically here at U of T. And I really like to think about um, the whole community here at U of T as an ecosystem. The ecosystem, uh, an ecosystem of different voices and different approaches that are all approaching AI from their own particular disciplines, but which together are gonna help us find a way to make a really livable future where we take advantage of the possibilities that, the amazing possibilities that AI proposes, but at the same time can mitigate the challenges and the, and the, and the, and the dangers that it also poses. And um, I know, so, so one of the interesting things about the, the, uh, the BMO lab is it is actually in a building that is connected to the computer science building. So the Kof, it's in the Koffler Center, but the, uh, the computer science building we can access through a tunnel in the basement. It's across the street from the My Hall Center of Engineering. It's right next to physics. It's near, it's close to medicine and just down, the, uh, down College Street, a short stroll to the Vexter Institute. So we're sort of in a hotbed right in the middle of all this. It's very exciting to be there. And I, 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 I wanted to ask Richard if he can talk, because I'm curious too about how Vector fits it, because it's got a different relationship, how it fits into this ecology. Right. So Vector is, uh, as many of you know, I'm sure it's a um, nonprofit institute where most of the faculty and students are at U of T, uh, but there's also a number of other uh, universities represented there. We have faculty from Waterloo and Guelph and a number of other universities and their students are there as well. And we also have affiliations with hospitals and other institutes, a number of faculty from other institutes. So it's a kind of 
big umbrella organization. It gets its funding from the federal government, from provincial government. We have a number of sponsors, including BMO, uh, as our generous sponsors. And so we work together with the sponsors and work together with these, you know, all the different institutes. So it's a, kind of a large organization. Um, and I think part of the idea here is, to me, and it's exciting about this center, is that we have all of these, there's kind of two real pillars, I would say, at, at um, Vector. There's one that's working a lot with the provinces and, trying to, and the government trying to do things like health. Other ones working with the, uh, in working on applications with many of the sponsors. And then we have a number of people doing core machine learning research uh, in fundamental kind of questions around machine learning. And this kind of affiliation with the center will enable us to do lots of other very exciting collaborative research. Yeah. Um, I think the key thing, we've heard this from almost all the speakers, is to make one of the most important things to make uh, AI work for us is that it has to be a, an unprecedented collaboration across disciplines. That's the only way it's going to work. And um, I think one of the interesting challenges that that poses is, as we know, the disciplines don't always get together so well. They don't always communicate so well. Um, so, so the real challenge, and the real challenge that is at the core of BMO Lab is, is to do and to find ways to make that kind of collaboration effective and possible, and through that process to train people to be good at that, because we're going to need those people. Now, um, so I wanted to, I, I, there's something that I found really interesting. Just to, I wanted to talk a little bit with Richard about AI research itself, because I, I don't think a lot of us really understand what's, the, the complexity of what's going on there. One of the things that I find really interesting uh, about a, researchers in AI who, who I've met is that they're very interested, very focused on the precise research topics that they're working on, but they're also, to me, surprisingly interested in understanding the implications of the things that they're doing. And uh, I found that, I found that like, striking and comforting, in fact. Yeah. And I wonder if you had some thoughts yeah, about so that. Yes, I do think that um, a lot of AI researchers are interested in kind of the fundamental, I'd say, like mathematical or statistical basis to, of what they're doing. But they're also motivated by real world problems and motivated by interesting applications. And so a lot of the great ideas, I think, come from either an application or something that somebody's trying to do with the machine learning system. And that really gets people excited and gets new ideas going in the field. So I think it's through these, and that's why I think, you know, a lot of AI researchers work on all kinds of applications, sometimes simultaneously, because the idea is the same method may be useful in a number of different ways. And when you find some new application, it can give you a, a next idea for another, an, another research direction. And I know that you have done some particular research in the area of fairness in AI. And I was really curious how that, how that is connected to the rest of the kinds yeah. of research that you've done. Yeah, so well, that's like a, a personal history. So I was, um, I've been doing AI for a long time. And there was an old saying when I first did it way back, you know, several decades ago, there was the saying was it was only AI until it, it worked. <laughs> And, um, and then I was really shocked to see, we were then working away for many years, and I was shocked to see about you know, eight or nine years ago that to learn that we were getting these great successes and everybody was paying attention, and a little bit shocked and, and sometimes appalled to see how the systems were being used. So they're being used for making decisions about loans and being uh, you know, who gets hired. You know, in legal settings, they're being used to decide bail and all these other things, often with systems that aren't very well tested and kind of validated. And so for myself, I got motivated to say, well, we should really be thinking a little bit more about how these systems are being used and how we can you know, look at, try to help out and make sure that they're being used in fair ways. You know, they aren't discriminating against certain groups. And so, for, and the interesting thing I found is that when we started working on this and got excited about it, that it was naturally kind of contagious. A lot of students come in, and they're super excited to work on these things. They think it's important. They don't want to just work on the, you know, in the trenches working out the details. They want to see how the systems are used and learn how to make them safer and more useful for, uh, for society. And another thing that really strikes me about AI research is it is already quite interdisciplinary within itself. And I wanted to, to uh, use a reflection from uh, um, a writer named David Chapman, who is also an MIT uh, PhD in computer science uh, and artificial intelligence talking about 
the, diff the, the strange world of artificial intelligence. And he noted that it's a mixture in many ways of science, mathematics, philosophy, engineering, and design altogether. And each of these worlds has its own very different ways to set itself goals and to figure out ways of validating whether it's achieved those goals. So he, he says that in science, mathematics, and philosophy, each seek to discover interesting explanatory truths, but each has different definitions of interesting explanatory and truth. So that's a challenge right there. In engineering and design, they're both interested in creating useful artifacts, but whereas engineering seeks to apply well-characterized techniques to well-characterized problems, to yield well-characterized practical uh, solutions, design and the arts tend to seek this, uh, poor, to solve poorly characterized problems where the problems find definition through a reflective conversation with materials. So what's happening in AI is all of these things are happening at the same time. And I think and that may be even one of the reasons why there is that reflectiveness as well. When you're dealing with things from many different angles, I think you see things in a more expanded way. When we consider the fact that on top of this, AI is reaching into every corner of our lives, as, as has come up already in, in several of the talks, we really need to, uh, there's, a, there's a broad set of factors that go into considering the fairness of something, the, the, the appropriateness of an AI system. Um, so I think a, a really key question is how do we prepare people to be really good at this level of interdisciplinarity? People who are doing AI are often coming from a math-like background, although I, wanted to, I, I figure you find people in the AI research area who are coming from a lot of different directions. Yeah. Is, that, is, there a, is there a standard entry point, or is it all over the place? Not really. So it used to be you know, that you had to have a really strong computer science background, but nowadays there's so many people are interested in it that it's great. We get this real melting pot. We have people coming from physics and other technical areas. We also get people coming from the arts who are very interested and motivated by some problems, and then they learn the technical side of things, and they contribute a lot as well. So I think it has this natural interdisciplinary feel. And, and going back to what you were saying earlier about these different sides, I guess what that made me think about was, you know, part of AI, like I said, is very tied to engineering. That's, the, that's the, what it used to be called when it works, is, was engineering. Um, and there is still that important component of it. A lot of people are spending time trying to get their, their system to get the extra 0.1%, you know, to be the top of some sort of leaderboard. And there's a lot of engineering that goes into that. But there's also another side that, honestly, I find much more exciting is when you can, you know, do something that's maybe a little bit more qualitative, less quantitative. And, and I think there is that inherent interest, and students certainly feel that too. There's a lot of students who come at it and want to do something that's kind of interesting and interdisciplinary. So I think there's a natural appeal of this kind of interdisciplinary work for the students and some of the faculty too. <laughs> and, and I was curious because you, I was, oh, birds, all right. Okay. I, we're being blessed. Uh, I, was, I was very pleased and honored to have been invited by the Vector Institute to give the inaugural distinguished lecture on creativity right. and AI. And I was, so I, did you have, why did you decide to invite me to do that? We talked <laughs> briefly and I thought, <laughs> I thought I was gonna be invited to come and it chat wasn't to a, a couple mistake. of lectures. It was a very good talk. Okay. No, but no, anyway, so I, <laughs> yeah. was, uh, I was curious how creativity fits into the equation for you. Yeah, no, I think there is a natural side of, of AI that is interested in creativity and trying to build systems that are useful in uh, creative endeavors and trying to understand how creativity comes into it because there is a trying to build something that's useful for artists and useful in, in, in other ways and, and I think there is this yeah natural interest I would say in that and, and part of it is that we want to you know develop systems that are not just good, but we're trying to understand, so this is a little bit maybe back to the interdisciplinary nature, right? So there's things that our systems currently are really good at, like we can, you can give us a thousand examples of what a, a, a picture of a hippo and a thousand examples of a picture of a rhino, and we can learn, the systems can tell hippos and rhinos apart. But what we want to be able to do is then take that same system and have it learn to say, this is an elephant after just seeing a couple pictures of an elephant. Right, so this is something that people are really good at, but our current systems aren't that, that good at learning without that much information. So this is more back to the inter interdisciplinary nature, maybe the cognitive science stuff. So people who work on cognitive science have something to offer there, because people are naturally good at that. Maybe we can learn something from how people can 
you know, transfer their knowledge that they've gained in one domain to another domain. So I think that's really important. And the same thing goes for creativity. Transfer our information and knowledge we gain from the arts to you know, the, the study of machine learning. It's a, for, I became really interested in um, artificial intelligence in the 90s when it didn't work very well. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, partly because I found that it helped me think about human intelligence in new ways. Uh -huh. And so having those things, ha in fact, I think uh, there's an interesting thing that sometimes implementations are really interesting learning systems. You implement something, you, you make it work, and then you realize how your assumptions and your understandings are wrong. And that's also a very valid way to go. I wanted to, I wanted to get back to the question of how we prepare people for the future in this way. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the experience we have in our class, uh, where we have basically half people in the computer science and uh, engineering side, and half people in music and theater and the arts, et cetera. And what's, what we found really striking is, first, of course, there are problems. <laughs> You know, we, there are different languages that are being spoken. A certain word will mean a different thing depending on who's listening, and that can create all sorts of misunderstandings. There are different ways of setting goals, and so it takes some time to, to, to get people talking, but we found actually, very surprisingly to me, that there's a lot of ability to work together already. Very early in this, this year, we found, I, 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 it made me think that perhaps what we're seeing is a generation that's interdisciplinary native. We think of them as digital native. Well, maybe they're interdisciplinary native. Maybe they're more ready than we think for this future. And our job is actually to not crush that in them, that what we need to find are ways to, to, create, to come up with pedagogies that, find, that, that encourage for people who have the natural ability to mix across multiple disciplines to, to, to support that, because we're going to need those people. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things we're really looking at in the lab, is strategies for getting people to cross those bridges and feel comfortable, and to create a space where it's actually normal to be talking across disciplines all the time. So, so let me just say, you, so, so that dovetails a lot with, I think, the, a current direction in machine learning research, which is to think that we're, instead of just building these systems in isolation, really what it's about is building systems that are gonna work with society and often work with humans. So rather than thinking of building some autonomous decision maker, often there's humans involved with it and there's some systems that involve, you know, computers are either giving advice or, you know, the human is relying on them. There's some interplay between the two of them. And so I think for our students and in general, we want, many of our students have a natural interest. There's an area called multi-agent systems where some of those agents could be computers or robots and some of those agents are people. And so we're, how those two interact is, is really important and that's something we have to train our students. And part of it is not only doing research in that area but also learning how to talk to different people who come from these different backgrounds in different ways. Because you know, if, if the system's gonna be used in a legal setting and work with judges and it helps for the student who's working on that kind of project to understand more about the law and more about judges and more. And so that kind of communication and understanding interdisciplinary nature is super important to both to the machine learning research and actually to get them used in practice. And I think there's an amazing example that really, really articulates this issue well, which is that they've discovered, you know, we know now that computers can beat us at chess. It was the big crisis, human, humanist crisis when Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov. What we've discovered, however, is that a team of, a of an AI and a human are better than a computer, an AI. So a team works, it can beat any, a good team can beat uh, the AI. And that's really an interesting, I think an interesting thing that we need to, to look at very carefully. And what it, what it opens the question, the, the question that opens is, is you know, there's of course the concern, and it's a, it's a real substantial concern that needs to be taken seriously of AI replacing jobs. But there is also, from our perspective, the very interesting possibility of augmentation, of creativity. In, in the lab, we're thinking of creativity augmentation. How does the technology allow us to be more creative, to, to work in new ways that we couldn't even imagine before? And that's a very exciting possibility. And that's really one of the key things we're looking at at, at the lab. And uh, this, this starts to lead into for me, maybe the big question that may still be on some of your minds: why arts and theater? Why has the Bank of Montreal actually made this amazing commitment in an area that seems like maybe a little off to the side of where main research is happening in, in AI? And I think the answer is that what happens in theater 
groups of people working already interdisciplinary, technicians and actors and directors and things like that, working together, dealing with humans, human bodies in social contexts, in communication in real time in front of a public. This is a really interesting test space for all sorts of things and are also a really interesting thing that, that, that actually gives us the whole range of challenges, the human with machine challenges that we're seeing in the workplace, in politics, in society in general. And so it's, it's a kind of perfect sandbox for playing with these things out of the context of the really practical solutions uh, or practical challenges that we're looking at, which gives us also a longer time arc, which I think is also a very valuable thing. We can afford, because we're not trying to solve, the, uh, solve a, a technical challenge for next week, we can afford to take a longer view, uh, ask questions that might have, uh, have a, a, a more uh, intangible side to them, and I think that's a really valuable and exciting thing. Now, one of the key things we're doing in the lab, and I know this is something that connects to some research you've done, is, is looking at tracking the movement of bodies as a way to integrate with what happens naturally on stage. In, in theater, you have bodies moving on stage in relationship to each other, et cetera. So we're looking a lot at things like that. I know you were involved in some uh, gait and skeleton tracking stuff uh, uh, at some point. We're, we're then looking for ways to take that information and integrate it interestingly into other kinds of systems. And we actually have, we have a demo of something. This is very fresh. This is something uh, that didn't exist a week ago. Uh, but we have a demo to show you uh, involving a performer who is going to be controlling through, uh, first the control system has some artificial intelligence in it, but it's controlling a very interesting um, other neural network that is capable of generating an infinity of faces. There's so many faces, this thing can generate so many faces from a set of numbers. We actually, f we found uh, Professor Gertler's face in there, and we found <laughs> my face. We can't put your face up there because of a, we were gonna put your face up there. <laughs> Let's just say, it, there, we found the Mona Lisa in there. Even with the colors, it was quite a remarkable, uh, what's called a generative adversarial network. It's capable of, of generating, having seen millions of images of faces, it can now generate faces of people who have never existed. And so what we're gonna do is present a very, sh a very uh, preliminary demo of a face being controlled through the movement of our performer. As a Nicole, Nicole can come up and then we need the switcher to go to black. And so I, I, will, I will describe, so why don't you make a few movements for us first, Nicole. Now, and why don't you move a little closer? If you, she moves closer to the sensing camera, the faces approach what is the sort of the most normal face within its whole range. If you step back quite a distance now, <laughs> it falls off the edge of what's called the latent space and becomes impossible faces that are quite expressive but uh, definitely strange. And now, can you move back to the middle space and give us some, can you, can you bring some sadness into the picture? Okay, and how, can you give us a beard? I don't know if this one will give us a beard quite as well. Just a little bit of facial hair. Okay, that was not good. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. And you'll notice if she shifts her weight to one side or the other, for example, the face turns. And this is all, none of these faces, these are not pre-recorded faces. This is being generated from a set of hundreds of numbers, and each set of hundreds of numbers generates a unique face. So what's the interesting challenge here is how do you take something like a bunch of numbers, how do you connect it to a human being? So this is a very simple example, how we take something very fundamentally human, how we move our body and connect it to something expressive. Uh, Xavier, do you want to switch to the, uh, this is another set of possible faces, which we have a, can you take the devil pose? <laughs> There's a very uh, disturbing character. In, where is it, where is it, where is it? There we go. <laughs> oh. You had it and you lost it. Uh, there we go, there we go. And yeah, and so that's just an example of just the, again and again, this is, and I should say that the face generation research is coming out of a research lab uh, at NVIDIA. Um, this is a Microsoft tracker, so the AI there is coming from somewhere else. One of the things that we want to really do at the lab is learn ways to integrate systems that already exist into new applications 
and then find places where there are applications that are specific to what we're doing, what we need in theater, and do the basic research in collaboration perhaps with people at Vector or in computer science to find ways to make that happen. So thank you very much, Nicole. <laughs> So, uh, um, do you have any, anything else to say at this point? So I guess I, <laughs> it's hard to follow that up. Um, so, I would say that there's this yeah, inherent interest, you asked earlier about creativity. There's a number of, uh, there's a, a large research strand working on creativity and trying to build systems that are useful for, um, you know, for creative expression. So one example I can think of is music generation. So this was like facial generation. There's a lot where people are building tools that are useful for things, not just like transcribing piano music, but actually building tools that enable new variations and new ideas in piano that can, in, in music, that an that artist can interact with and kind of get new ideas from and, and uh, have a nice collaboration. So I think that idea that I'm familiar with in music can also be used in the performance art, I believe. Um, and I think that's something that fits in very well with a lot of the research we had. So there's a lot of people at Vector that are working on the music side of it and are also working on developing systems that have representations that can be manipulable in a way and controllable by an artist to be able to develop new ideas and new, uh, like new faces or new music, new motion of a body or something like that. So I think it's a very exciting uh, potential for this kind of collaboration. I agree. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to finish by saying it's, again, really exciting. I want to thank the Bank of Montreal and the university for, this, for creating the space where, in this very big ecosystem of AI, we, can, we have the possibility to create this new and unusual thing that sort of completes the circle and adds to that. So I'm very grateful for that. And uh, thanks to Richard yeah, for joining me you. in this conversation. I have one more task that I demand of thee. Will thee, will thou, perform to point the tempest that I bade thee? It's very low. Should be. So I wanted to briefly let you know what was happening there, other than the obvious. 
<clears throat> can you reveal the sensor? So under this tennis band, there is a sensor which detects angle, uh, rotation. Oh, yeah, let me see. Actually, I think we got a little bit of thunder there. Some wind comes in. Turn it the other way. No, it's turned down a bit, so we're not hearing it. But let's just say that this, this, all the con everything you heard was controlled by this sensor through his gesture. And the thunderclaps were from a sudden thing like that. Again, the sound's down, but you saw the lights there. And this, and this was something that we, uh, that we used in our first year. Last year, we did the first uh, round of our course um, crossing disciplines in uh, emerging technology and theater. And uh, P Louis Pino is here, is he not? Where's Louis? There's Louis. Louis was the one who first came to us and said, we can make the storm. We, we, could think, we were doing the Tempest, and we said, you can, we can make the storm with this sensor that I've got. And he came up with the original sketch for this, and it was a feature in both performances we did of the Tempest um, live on stage using various technologies. So that was, uh, so that was, and what was exciting about that, what was really interesting from an actor's point of view, was the way that the actor, because it was not synchronized by someone else, it was really in his control. He could hold on to the moment. Okay, I'm gonna hit you with the thunder now. And there's a kind of dynamics that that makes possible, an improvisational dynamics that makes possible that's not possible with conventional theater technology. So that's just an example of something we did last year uh, as a little bit of excitement for the, to, to round out our conversation. Daryl, I want you to know this technology is available for your next annual general meeting. <laughs> Might be handy. Um, I'm certainly thinking about its application, <laughs> fundraising. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Trevor Jablonowski performing a piece called Storm. Earlier, we saw Nicole Unjun Bell, who is performing the face demo. Uh, Mr. Jablonowski was a participant, as you heard, in Professor Clear Kleber's Fall 2018 course, Collisions in Common Ground, Our Technology Performance. So again, thank you very much for sharing that with us. And I'd also like to thank David Rokeby and Professor Zemmel for their fascinating discussion leading up to that performance. Thank you so much. And now, in conclusion, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rose Patton. Dr. Patton is the 34th Chancellor of the University of Toronto, where she is also Executive in Residence and Adjunct Professor in Executive Leadership Programs at the Rotman School of Management, a longtime senior executive at BMO Financial Group. She is also a distinguished former chair of the university's Governing Council. Among many other accolades over the years, Dr. Patton was appointed an officer of the Order of Canada in 2017. Chancellor Patton. So thank you, David. Thank you, Minister. And thank you to all our speakers and performers for making this celebration quite memorable. This is a very special day for all of us. Uh, for a moment, let me say it's very special for me, given my profoundly strong ties to these two great Canadian institutions, the Bank of Montreal and the University of Toronto. My volunteering with the latter began at the same time as my employment with the former, almost three decades ago. And here is another historical coincidence. BMO celebrated its bicentennial two years ago while the University of Toronto is preparing for its 200th anniversary in 2027. Both institutions have played, played foundational roles in building this country. It is so fitting, therefore, that we have join, joined forces to help address one of the most important challenges of our time. 
Now, on this occasion, with so many of my BMO friends and colleagues in the room, and since I'm wearing my chancellor hat today, I must take this opportunity to share a few points of pride about the University of Toronto. In all major surveys, U of T is consistently ranked as Canada's leading university. As one of the world's greatest institutions of higher education and advanced research. Just a few weeks ago, Times Higher Education ranked U of T 18th in the world overall, a remarkable jump of three spots from last year. Among public institutions, we rank eighth in the world and third in North America, just after Berkeley and UCLA. U of T has placed 18th in the world for both arts and humanities and computer sciences, two key areas that will intersect in the heart of this brilliant new BMO lab that Merrick and Derek has told us about. Merrick and Daryl. In addition, other authoritative surveys rank U of T fourth globally for the performance of our scientific papers, while our innovation ecosystem is among the top five university-managed business incubators on the entire planet. And finally, I'm always especially pleased to note that undergraduates are ranked 12th in the world for their employability. As Merrick mentioned, they are well represented in our BMO institution. Such numbers are truly remarkable, but they are merely a reflection of the talent we attract. The excellence of our faculty, our staff, our students, and our alumni, and the presence of wonderful presidential leadership. The initiative unveiled today is absolutely a perfect example of the talent that drives our global stature and our impact. It is the thanks to the work of Richard Zimmel, Jeffrey Hinton, and their colleagues in the Department of Computer Science and U of T is one of the world's leading centers of machine learning research. Their vision for the future of this technology in Toronto led to the creation of the Victor Institute. It also paved the way for the Swartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society, which will complement the mission of the BMO Lab by addressing the social and the ethical implications of AI and other emerging technologies. But U of T's excellence depends only, not only on our academic strength across so many fields, it is also due to the vision and the generosity of our leading volunteers, our leading benefactors. And in this sense, the announcement of the Bevo Lab is just such a splendid illustration. Philanthropy of this magnitude ensures that we can continue providing top quality, leading edge education for our students. And at the same time, champion donors enable us to serve as Canada's greatest engineer, engine of innovation and a global hub of creativity for the benefit of people and the communities everywhere. So let me close by putting on my BMO cap and saying to Daryl, and to all of you, how incredibly proud I am of this visionary gift we celebrate today. Thank you. Thank you for the great work you have set in motion today. And thank you for the creativity and the genius that it will inspire for the many years to come. Thank you. And this brings us to the end of the formal program, but our celebration continues, and I invite you all to stay and enjoy the reception. Thank you again, and thank you all for being here, and thank you for this extraordinary gift. My pleasure. <laughs>